I'm Tom Williams. I used to be married to Kayla Williams. We had been married for about 17 years when everything fell apart. Of course, I got blamed for it. That's what happens to the innocent schmucks in our wonderful divorce courts in this country. Blame the man, then let the ex-wife have full custody so she can tell the kids what a horrible person their father is. I swear, the divorce laws in this country were written by a bunch of man-hating feminists out to screw over anyone with a male organ. As I said, we had been married for 17 years and had two kids, a 14-year-old son and a 16-year-old daughter. I thought everything was going great. I love my wife, and I was sure that she loved me. Our kids were smart, athletic, well-adjusted, and good-looking. Carly was a daddy's girl, and Josh was a friendly and athletic boy. I was making decent money as a mechanical engineer, and Kayla had a good job working as an accountant. We both worked out to keep in shape and were both fairly good-looking. Carly was a daddy's girl through and through. She seemed to idolize me, and I was wrapped around her little finger. She was good at math and science, so she decided she wanted to be an engineer like daddy. She got her driver's license the day she turned 16. Like me, she loved driving. From when she was 10 years old, she would be out in the garage handing me wrenches as I worked on the various toys I acquired. I am an unashamed gearhead. I love old cars, mainly GM products, that I can tinker with and build up. She developed my love for them as well. Some weekends, we would go to car shows together and spend the day drooling over those wonderful machines. It just seemed that we were practically joined at the hip. Almost every weekend, I was also pretty handy with home improvement projects. Carly was always excited about helping me with projects around the house. I taught her basic plumbing, electrical work, drywall, and painting. She was right there with me when I installed new appliances. She even helped me with a new concrete slab I put in beside my shop. While Carly would go to her mother for female issues, which I was very happy about, it was me she would come to for advice and help with everything else, homework, drama with her friends, advice on things she was thinking of doing, boys, etc. We were very open and honest with each other. When she got into trouble, it was my phone she called for help. I had my daddy's girl, and Kayla had her mama's boy. Josh never really got into cars and mechanics like his older sister did. He was a good student, but science didn't excite him much. He excelled more in English and literature and started talking about becoming a lawyer. Sure, Josh and I hung out as well, but he seemed to be more attached to his mom than to me. Kayla seemed to be a bit off for the last couple of weeks. There was nothing overt, but she just seemed a tad distant and would kind of zone out for a minute or two. Lately, I asked her a couple of times if everything was okay, but she would just blow me off and dismiss my concern. Usually, I quite enjoyed it when she would blow me off, but this was not that type of blow off. Again, nothing really overt, but just a bit off. It was on a Friday evening, I had just gotten home from work. It was 6 o'clock, as was my usual time getting home on a Friday evening. I saw that Kayla was already home. As usual, I walked in the door and called out that I was home. Unusually, there were no smells of dinner cooking. Also, Carly didn't come down to greet me. Granted, she's a teenager now, but she usually greets me if she's home. She and Josh must still be out with friends. Oh well, I set my briefcase in my office and went upstairs to change into more comfortable clothes for the evening. When I walked into the bedroom, I saw that my wife had laid out her little black dress, sexy underwear, stockings, and high heels. That explained the lack of dinner smells, obviously, we were going out tonight instead. I wish she would have given me a heads up, but I hadn't made any other plans anyway. Kayla was still in the bathroom applying her makeup when I walked in. Where are we going, sweetheart? I asked as I started to take off my dress shirt. We aren't going anywhere, she replied. That was odd. Well, if we aren't going anywhere, why are you getting all dressed up and have a sexy outfit laid out on the bed? I said. We aren't going out, she said again. I am, really. And just where do you imagine you're going dressed like that without me? Also, where are the kids? I had a bad feeling about this. The kids are spending the night with friends. I'm not sure exactly where my date will be taking me, but I most likely won't be home until tomorrow morning sometime. What do you mean, 
your date and you won't be back until the morning. Just what I said. I'm going on a date tonight, and if it goes as planned, I will be spending the night with him, she said calmly. The hell you are. What makes you think for even a second that I will put up with that? Screw that. If you want to go out and spread your legs, you can wait until the divorce is final. Stop being stupid. There will be no divorce. I'm just going to do this once, then everything will be back to normal. I need this night. We've been married for 17 years, and I just need to go out once to prove to myself that I'm still attractive to other guys. If you really love me, you will let me have this night, and it won't even be a blip on the radar. Well, if you really loved me, you wouldn't even consider doing this. I do love you, but I need this. I'm getting older and need to feel that I'm still attractive to other men, particularly younger men. Clarence is about 10 years younger than me. He's been flirting with me over the last six months, and I decided to finally take him up on his offer. It's just one night of intimacy to assure myself that I'm still a sexy woman who is attractive to other men. This is just a confidence booster for me. I've been noticing a few lines and a couple of gray hairs sneaking in, and I need a boost to my ego. I don't need this, and I'm not going to put up with it. Do you remember that part of the wedding vows about forsaking all others? You do this, and you're breaking your vows. Don't be silly. This is just a one-night thing. After I get back home, I will never do it again, I promise. Are you stupid, or do you think I'm stupid? After breaking the vow you made to me in front of God, family, and friends, do you honestly think I would ever believe a simple promise from you made in private? Simply put, if you go through with this, we are done. You walk out that door, and I will be meeting with a lawyer as soon as possible. Don't be an idiot. There will be no divorce. I will come home and be the loving, devoted wife I have always been. If you try to divorce me, I will fight it as long and as hard as I can. You will end up losing the house, most of the assets, and I will get full custody of the kids. Furthermore, I will do everything I can to screw up your visitation, and I will put the entire blame for breaking up the family on you. I will make sure that your kids end up hating you. I was shocked by her words. You claim to love me, yet you would do all that to me? Damn right I would. I do love you, but if you try to divorce me, I will fight you on it. I don't want to lose you, so I'm just giving you the consequences of your actions. Look, I told you that I just need this one night to prove that I am still attractive and sexy. Yeah, well, what happens in a few more years? What about the next time you start to think that you're still getting older and wonder if you can still attract a younger man? Let me guess, he has a big tool, and the gossip around the water cooler says he's a great lover. I'll bet he's hit almost every woman you work with, too. I promise that won't happen. And yes, there has been some gossip that I've overheard. I admit that I am curious, but it will just be intimacy. There won't be any love involved. You have nothing to fear from him taking me away from you. As I said, this is just a one-time thing to get this out of my system. Maybe I'll even learn a thing or two that will spice up our intimacy life. A couple of new tricks will liven up our lovemaking. If you follow through with this, I already told you the consequences of your actions. If you call him right now and cancel, we can go through marriage counseling and work to save our marriage. Don't be stupid. We are going to be fine. If you really insist on counseling to heal your bruised ego, we can talk about it when I get back tomorrow. With that, she continued to get ready for her date. I changed into a pair of jeans and a t-shirt, then left the room. She was downstairs a little while later, dressed in the clothes she had laid out. She had her little clutch and was inspecting herself in the mirror by the door. I was sitting in my recliner in the living room when I heard a honk from a car outside. He's here. I've gotta go. I'll see you in the morning, she said as she walked over to give me a kiss goodbye. I turned my head and leaned away from her. She ended up kissing her. She stood back up and regarded me with a frown. Fine, be that way. Once you get over your little hissy fit, everything will be back to normal. With that, she turned and strode toward the door. I made one last plea. If you walk out that door, we're done. You better think really hard about whether this is worth throwing 17 years of marriage away. She turned to look back at me. I'm not throwing anything away. As I said, 
I'll be back, and everything will go back to normal. With that, she opened the door and walked out. I began crying for the loss of my marriage and the woman I had loved exclusively for the last 20 years, 17 years of marriage, one year of engagement, and two years of exclusive dating. I had no idea how she could do this to me. She had never expressed any dissatisfaction to me. We had a decent intimacy life, and she never mentioned wanting more. I would have gladly given her more if she had wanted it. We hadn't been fighting about anything, sure, there were some disagreements, as there are with all couples, but we discussed things and came to a mutual agreement. I had decided what I was going to do if she went through with this. After half an hour, I finally got up and went to work. I guess I waited that half hour for her to come to her senses and come back. Obviously, that wasn't happening. I went upstairs and began my plan. It really wasn't much of a plan, but it was the best I could do at the time. We lived in a fairly large four-bedroom house, the master bedroom, Carly's room, Josh's room, and a large guest bedroom. The guest bedroom was actually a second master bedroom with a private bathroom. We used it for when either her family or mine visited, and also for the kids' sleepovers. Now it would be my temporary bedroom. It took me about two hours to completely move out of our old bedroom and into my new bedroom. I was under no illusions about what would happen in our divorce. This was a no-fault state, which meant that the divorce laws here were biased against men. Unless the wife was convicted of a major felony and sent to prison for at least a decade, the husband got screwed. It didn't matter if the husband was a completely innocent victim, the wife would end up with the house, the kids, child support, and maintenance, while the husband would be stuck with all the bills. She would get the gold mine, and he would get the shaft. After getting my new temporary living quarters squared away, I went down to my home office and logged into our online banking. I had opened another account just in my name a few years ago. It wasn't for any nefarious purposes, it was just so I could buy her gifts and surprise her. We both had access to our finances, and there were a few times when she went to check on our finances and happened to see a purchase I had made for her. Needless to say, there wasn't much of a surprise for her birthday or Christmas. Thus, I opened a new account in just my name, strictly for purchasing her presents and keeping her from knowing what she was getting in advance. I decided to repurpose that account. She knew about it, but she didn't have any access to it. First off, I transferred exactly half of our checking and savings into my personal account. Next, using the remaining money in the joint account, I paid off and cancelled all our credit cards. I then applied for a couple of new cards in my name only. Yes, I should have paid everything off before transferring any money, but I decided it was better to pay back whatever a court ordered me to than to try and collect anything from her. I would transfer my direct deposit from work into my personal account on Monday morning. When I got to work, I would also have to call our broker and have our investments split on Monday as well. Having accomplished what I could, I got another tumbler of Jim Beam on the rocks and went up to my room for the night. I finished my drink as I got ready for bed. It was not a good night's sleep. First off, I had gotten used to sleeping next to my wife. The bed seemed empty without her there. Then, my mind simply wouldn't shut off. I kept going over what I could have done to prevent this. Should I have tried to force her not to go out the door? Physically restrained her? Gone out to the car with a baseball bat? Would going to jail have been worth it? It was a long night. I did doze on and off fitfully, but not much. I finally decided to get up as light began coming through the window. I was still tired, so I decided to shower, more to help myself fully wake up than anything else. After shaving, showering, and brushing my teeth, I put on jeans and a t-shirt and went downstairs. I ate breakfast and drank a couple of cups of coffee while reading the newspaper. At 9 o'clock in the morning, Kayla walked back into the house. I was in my office on the computer, looking at apartments to rent. I had already researched lawyers and made an appointment for Monday afternoon through their online scheduling. Good morning, honey. I'm home, just like I promised, she cheerfully greeted as she breezed into the house. I just ignored her. Throughout the night and this morning, my rage had begun to build at what she had done. I realized, as I was drinking my coffee, that I had done nothing to deserve this disrespect from her. I also realized that there was nothing I could have done to prevent what she did. This was all on her. If I had somehow managed to stop her date last night, 
she would have just done it again another time. There are a lot of people who say you can't stop loving someone suddenly. Perhaps they are right. What you can do is turn that love into hate. The opposite of love is not hate, it is indifference. With hate, there is still emotion involved. Marriage counselors often can save a marriage if there is hate by turning that back into love. If there is indifference, there is no chance at all. All my love for my wife, which I had felt yesterday before I got home, had now been channeled into hate. It was remarkably simple to do. All I needed to do was focus on the lack of respect she had shown me. Then I added her threats if I didn't go along with it, along with her dismissive attitude towards my feelings. I had several hours to focus on all that. Honey, where are you? I'm home, just like I said. I even cleaned up before coming home for you, she called out as she went around the house looking for me. Oh, there you are, she said as she opened the door to my office. I'm back, and now everything can go back to normal, she continued as she came over to my desk. She moved around the desk with her arms out to give me a hug and kiss. I shoved her back. Keep your filthy, diseased lips away from me, you nasty woman. God only knows what you've touched or what nastiness has been in that mouth of yours. Her eyes widened in shock. I had never spoken to her like that in all the years we'd known each other. Before she could even think about responding, I continued, you need to go down to the clinic and get a full battery of STD tests done. I want to see a notarized clean report from you before I ever allow you to put your filthy paws on me again. As far as intimacy is concerned, I wouldn't touch you with a ten-foot pole, even if I put a dozen condoms on it. I watched her facial expression turn from shock to anger. I was hoping for a realization of what she had done and some remorse. I can see that you're still dealing with your bruised ego. I'm going up to our room to take a nap. I had a long night and want to rest for a while. Hopefully, you will calm down and we can talk later. I expect a full apology for your rudeness this morning. With that, she turned and stormed out of the room. I couldn't help but smile as I anticipated her quick return. I was not to be disappointed. What the hell did you do? I heard her scream as she charged back in. Where are your clothes? Where are all your toiletries? What the hell do you think you're doing? She ranted as she stormed back into my office. What do you mean? I asked calmly. All my things are exactly where they are supposed to be. What are you talking about? Your closet is empty. Your drawers are empty. Your area on the vanity is empty. Ah, now I see your problem. You see, you are still mistakenly thinking of your bedroom as our bedroom. I just told you that all of my stuff is where it belongs, in my bedroom. You mean? Yes, I told you that I would not put up with it, so I moved out of your bedroom. I'll be staying in my new bedroom until I find an apartment and move out. I thought about telling her about our finances, but I decided against it. Let her find out on her own. Besides, there was no sense in spoiling the surprise before I could take care of the investments. Her eyes narrowed in irritation. We will discuss this later. I will give you a week to get over your little fit, then I expect you to move everything back and we will go back to normal. Not until I have that notarized report stating that you are free from all diseases, I shot back as I turned my attention back to the computer. I stayed in my office for most of the day. The kids came home early in the afternoon. I briefly wondered how long it would take them to figure out that there was a problem. I found a few apartments that looked good, so I filled out the forms and scheduled appointments to look at them on Tuesday. I then printed out our financial statements, which I would need for the lawyer on Monday. While I was under no illusions about having the house sold, I figured that getting a value on it might help in the settlement. Theoretically, she would only have the value of the equity, wishful thinking, but still. I spent the remainder of the day researching the divorce laws in our state. I knew that I was going to get screwed over, but at least I would have some idea of how bad it would be. That would help me plan if nothing else. Daddy, dinner's ready, Carly said as she stuck her head in the door. Okay, sweetie. Kayla was smiling brightly when I stepped into the kitchen. It was obvious what the plan was, killing me with kindness and showing me what I would be losing by not accepting what she had done. She had gone all out. She had dressed up, put on makeup, and styled her hair in the way I liked. She had spent a considerable amount of time in the kitchen that afternoon preparing my favorite meal. 
As I entered the kitchen, she came over to me and handed me a glass of wine. I poured you a glass of wine, she said, leaning in for a kiss. I saw the hurt in her eyes as I leaned away from her. I took the glass from her, walked over to the sink, poured it out, and set the glass on the counter. I then pulled a tumbler out of the cabinet, put a couple of cubes of ice in it, and pour a couple of fingers of Jim Beam. There was no way the kids at the table didn't notice. Moving over to the table, I sat down and began chatting with the kids, never acknowledging my wife. Dinner was obviously strained. I kept up the conversations with the kids as much as possible, but it was blatantly obvious that there were serious problems. It didn't help that I never put anything on my plate, much less ate anything. These dishes were my favorites, but I just passed the bowls and platters along without even looking at them. I continued trying to make conversation with my kids as I sipped my drink. Dad, are you going to eat anything? Josh finally asked. No, not hungry, was all I replied. After the most awkward dinner in the history of mankind, I simply got up, refilled my drink, and headed back to my office. I didn't even bother to help clear the table. About half an hour later, I shut down the computer, got the keys to my truck, and left the house to go to a nice, quiet restaurant for dinner. After that, I went over to the bar for a couple of drinks. It was pretty late by the time I got back home. I saw that the light was still on in Kayla's bedroom, so I made sure that when I closed the door to my room, it made enough noise for her to hear it. I locked the door and slid a chair under the knob. As I was getting ready for bed, I heard her try the knob and then knock. She tried to get me to open the door for about five minutes before finally giving up. I was up early the next morning. I decided that today would be a football day. There were three games on, morning, afternoon, and night, and I planned to watch them all. Yes, there were weekend chores to do, but I decided to ignore them. Screw it. I wouldn't be living here much longer, so Kayla could just get someone else to do it. I had already drunk most of the pot of coffee and began getting ready to make omelets for breakfast. I had already finished mine when Carly came wandering into the kitchen. Hey, sweetie. Omelet? I asked. Sure, Dad. Thanks, she replied. She got her juice and sat at the table as I began cooking her food. A few minutes later, Josh made his appearance. I told him I would make his as soon as I was finished with Carly's. Carly was eating her omelet as I was cooking Josh's. I heard Kayla in the hallway, so I poured the last cup of coffee into my cup and turned the pot off. She came shuffling in, got a cup from the cabinet, and then looked at the empty pot. You couldn't even leave a cup for me, she glared at me. The pot's right there. You know how to make it. Whatever. So you were making omelets? I said. I just finished, but feel free to make yourself one. I answered as I slipped Josh's omelet onto his plate. I used the last of what I had made for his omelet and had already put all the ingredients away. Screw her. Having taken care of the kids, I left the kitchen. It was just before noon when I was in the living room with the morning game on. Kayla came in carrying a plate and a bottle of beer. She set them down on the coffee table in front of me. I brought you some lunch and a beer so you wouldn't miss any of the game, she said cheerfully. Without so much as a glance at her, I took my foot and swept both the plate and the bottle off the table and onto the floor. She just stood there with her mouth open in shock. Just then, a commercial came on, so I stood up, walked into the kitchen, and got myself a beer. Yes, I hear all you out there crying about alcohol abuse for spilling an entire beer onto the floor, I thought. I wasn't going to drink anything she brought me, so it would have been wasted anyway. I didn't clean up the mess. She brought it uninvited, so she could clean it up herself. I didn't care if it stained the carpet. I wasn't going to be living there much longer anyway. We need to discuss this, Kayla began. Shut up. The game's on, I replied. For God's sake, you need to do something about your attitude. The kids have already noticed. Bound to happen. I'm sure they'd notice after I move out anyway. Oh, get over yourself. You are not moving out, and there will not be a divorce, she insisted as she stormed away. It started later in the afternoon. At least they were nice enough to wait until half time. Carly and Josh came into the room together. They sat on the couch facing me. Dad, 
What's going on between you and mom? Carly began. Well, you may as well know now. Your mother and I are getting a divorce. This has nothing to do with either of you. We both love you. This is just between your mother and me. But why? Josh asked. Because your mother did something that I just cannot accept. She did it even after I told her my feelings on it, but she still did it. She wasn't even the least bit remorseful. You mean when she went out on her date Friday night? Carly asked. You know about that? I was actually surprised. Well, yeah. Mom told us that you weren't happy about it, Carly said. So you know that she cheated on me, then? No, she didn't. She said she told you about it beforehand, so it wasn't cheating. She didn't sneak around behind your back to do it, and that was the only time she has ever done anything like that, Josh explained. Yeah, Dad. Besides, it was only one night out of the 20 years of you two dating and being married, Carly added. She said that if you really loved her, you would just let her have that one night and move on. I was honestly flabbergasted. It also hurt that my daddy's girl wasn't even bothering to understand my position. She had jumped onto her mother's side and wouldn't even listen to my point of view. Really? How about if she really loved me, she wouldn't even consider having intimacy with anyone else? I retorted. Come on, dad, it was just one time, and she promised that she would never do it again. Okay, let's discuss her promises then. A little over 17 years ago, she made a solemn vow to me. She made that vow before God, our families, and our friends. She vowed to forsake all others. There were no exception clauses in that vow. The time limit on that vow was until death do us part. In case you haven't noticed, neither one of us is dead. If she can so easily break that solemn vow she made so publicly, how can I possibly believe any promise that she makes to me in private? Yeah, but you also vowed to stick with her in good times and in bad times, Josh pointed out. Josh had been thinking of becoming a lawyer. I hoped he'd get a lot better at it than that. True. The problem is that your mother breaking her vow broke the contract and released me from my vow. Well, we just don't understand why you would break up the family over one single night, Carly asked. Why are you saying that I'm breaking up the family? Why am I getting blamed for what she did? Mom isn't leaving, she wants to put this behind us and move on. You are the one leaving and making such a big deal out of everything. If you leave, you are breaking up the family, Carly insisted. It didn't get any better after that. I tried to explain my position, but they weren't listening. They weren't even slightly interested in my opinion. Kayla had spent the last day filling their heads with her side of the story. All they knew was that mommy did something she really needed to do, and daddy didn't love her or the kids enough to accept her needs. She convinced them that daddy's little male ego was causing him to walk out on all of them and break up the family. It was daddy's fault because he couldn't give mommy one little tiny thing that she really needed for her happiness. Instead, daddy was intent on making everyone suffer for his small-minded stubbornness. Really, it was just one night out of the 20 years that they had been together. Seriously, what is one night out of 7,305 nights? 20 years at 365 days per year plus the one extra day on the five leap years? They finally stormed out when it was obvious that I wasn't going to accept their position. I managed to watch the rest of the game in peace. As the game was ending, I began smelling the aromas of dinner being prepared. It was obviously another of my favorites. I just sat there and watched the after game show as I waited for the night game. It was the top of the hour, kickoff would be in 20 minutes. Josh came in to tell me that dinner was ready. I simply got up, grabbed the keys to my truck, and began heading for the door. Where are you going? Dinner's being set on the table, Josh asked. I'm going down to the sports bar to watch the game. I'll eat something there, I replied. But mom fixed dinner. I'll be back after the game. I might hang out for a while after it's over, though. I did hang out after the game. They had a really good burger with seasoned fries. The beer was pretty good, too. I only had about one beer per quarter, so I was still good to drive. Besides, it was only about five minutes from home. Everyone was in bed by the time I got home, 
so I simply went to my bedroom, locked and blocked the door, and went to sleep. The plate and bottle by the coffee table had been cleaned up by the time I got home, which made me smile. Monday morning, I was up early and out of the house before anyone got up. The first thing I did when I got to the office was call my broker. I explained that I was going to get a divorce and needed him to split all of our investments right down the middle. He created a new account in just my name and moved half of our investments into that account. Next up was HR. I took Kayla's name off my retirement account and had them list Carly and Josh as my heirs. I also gave them my new bank account information to reroute my paycheck. Finally, I went and informed my boss that I was about to get divorced and would need some time off for meetings with my lawyer, court dates, etc. He was cool with it. My lawyer pretty much told me what I already knew. I had the deck stacked against me, so I would be getting screwed. There was a slight chance that I could get custody, but that was completely dependent on where the kids wanted to live. They were old enough that the court would take their wishes into serious consideration. Based on the conversation I had with them yesterday, I wasn't going to count on that. Basically, the only reason a guy even needs a lawyer for a divorce is for the lawyer to be able to apply lube to his rear end before the screwing. Otherwise, he would be drilled without lube. I had him start on the paperwork and asked that he serve her at work on Monday. I didn't even bother going home right after work. It was Monday night football, so I just drove over to the sports bar. Three tacos for a dollar, I had three during the first half and three more during the second half. I ignored the text messages and phone calls from Kayla, but I did respond to Carly and let her know where I was. Her response was not exactly pleasant. I was given the evil eye by all three when I sauntered in after the game. I simply went into my office and closed the door. By the time I was done and went up to my room, everyone had gone to bed. Tuesday morning, I was up early and out of the house before anyone else. Work was okay, and I took the afternoon off to look at apartments. I decided on a nice two-bedroom unit and put down the deposit. I would be able to move in on Saturday. A trip to a second-hand store netted me a couch, table, and chairs. They were to be delivered on Saturday afternoon. I decided that I liked the bed I was using, so I was going to take that, as well as everything in my home office. They were eating dinner by the time I got home. I snickered when I noticed that they didn't even set a plate for me. That was fine with me, I wasn't going to eat it anyway. I simply went to the refrigerator, pulled out the makings for a huge sandwich, made it, grabbed a bag of chips and a beer, and then went into my office. Jeez, Dad, why are you being such an a-hole? Carly exclaimed as she came into my office. Well, Carly, simply put, your mother cheated on me. She completely disrespected me and then threw it in my face. I clearly explained what would happen if she went through with it. She went through with it even knowing what would happen. You can't seriously be breaking up the family over that. Come on, it was nothing. It was just intimate. Carly, someday you are going to be married. Just think about how you would feel if your husband told you one evening that he had plans with a younger, more attractive woman and was going to spend the evening with her. Well, I'm sure I wouldn't like it very much, but if he promised to come back to me and it was just a one-time thing, I would hope that I would love him enough to move past it. Besides, if he told me about it first, it wouldn't be like he was being dishonest. Ah, uh, sure. Do me one favor, when you get married, look directly into your groom's eyes as you are saying your vows. As you're looking into his loving eyes, when you get to the part about forsaking all others, imagine the love in those eyes turning to complete devastation as you tell him that you are going out to be with another man. With that, I turned my back on her and went back to work. Wednesday evening was the surprise. Both sets of parents were there when I got home from work. People often joke about their in-laws, but I actually got along very well with her parents. They had welcomed me into their family like the son they never had. Charles, her father, was a car enthusiast like me. His only problem was that he was into Fords. Okay, so he had different taste in cars, but I could overlook that. He had a 69 Mustang Fastback that was in pristine condition. Yes, I got along very well with my parents too. We weren't one of those dysfunctional families that kids grow up resenting. They were always very loving and supportive of me. Sure, there were disagreements and they never hesitated to tell me when they thought I was wrong about something. Sometimes we just had to agree to disagree. So, 
I walked into the house and saw that the intervention had been arranged. I was a bit confused. I understood why her parents would be there, they would obviously be on her side. She is their daughter, after all. What confused me was that my own parents were there. That would seem counterproductive to her. My parents would agree with me and be on my side. I mean, if she were trying to get me to accept her mistake, why would she have anyone over who wouldn't be on her side and who would argue that I was right in wanting to separate? You probably already figured out what took me several more minutes to understand. Tom Charles started the intervention. I want you to know that May, Kayla's mother, and I are very disappointed in what Kayla did. That being said, we think that you are overreacting to this. Yes, she went out with another man, and that was highly disrespectful to you, especially in the way she did it. Still, it was just one mistake. You two have been together for a total of 20 years. You have two wonderful kids together. Think about all of that. Surely you can get over this one small incident. You don't need to tear your family apart just for one mistake. A small mistake? Seriously, this wasn't a small mistake. She didn't accidentally stumble into this situation. It was a planned event. They probably planned it at least a week in advance. Then she misled me only an hour before she was leaving, giving me no chance to stop it. This was a deliberate act against me. Son, mom decided to join the conversation. She didn't betray you. She told you about it first. Huh? First off, you are correct that she told me. She told me she was doing it, and I had no say in the matter. Even when I voiced my strong objections, she didn't care. Speaking of telling, I did tell her that this would happen if she went through with it. Tom, my dad tried to reason with me. I understand your pain and anger, but think about the family. We love you, son. We will be here to help you heal, but think of what you will be doing to your family. Kayla still cares for you and insists that she won't do it again. We all think that with counseling and some effort, you can get past this. Tearing your family apart is not the way to go. We raised you to be a good man, you need to be strong and keep your family together. Don't do something rash that will end up hurting your relationship with your family. Think about your mother and me, too. Those are our grandchildren, and we will do whatever is necessary to keep our relationship with them. I just stood there, completely stunned. My parents were actually taking her side. They were really telling me that I should overlook her mistake. I simply couldn't take any more of this. I turned and walked out of the room and went to my bedroom. Kayla tried to follow me but I shut the door before she could enter. Ten minutes later, I had changed into jeans, a casual shirt, and my boots. I never said a word as I walked right through the living room and out the front door. They were all sitting there, trying to talk to me as I walked past. I never even acknowledged them. I simply walked out the door, got in my truck, and went to the sports bar for dinner. Thankfully, the house was quiet and dark when I returned about four hours later. Thursday and Friday were just more of the same. I completely ignored Kayla, and my kids remained upset with me. I was kind of surprised that Kayla had not yet noticed that the credit cards were no longer working. I'm pretty sure that when she went to do her Saturday shopping, she would figure it out. It was Friday evening. I had been home for about an hour. I was in my office, going through a few things and deciding exactly what I would be taking tomorrow and what I would get later. Kayla opened the door and walked in, dressed in a way that showed she was trying to make amends. The kids are spending the night elsewhere tonight. It's time for you to get over this and come to bed with me. I want us to reconcile. I looked at her for a minute. No thanks. Besides, I have yet to see any proof that there are no lingering issues from your time away. Stop being ridiculous. I need you back in my life. Your attitude is not accomplishing anything. I'm not interested. Look, if you don't, then I'm going to have to call Clarence again. So much for that being a one-time thing. It was supposed to be a one-time thing. But if you're going to keep pushing me away, it's you who is driving me back to someone else. Let me know if you decide otherwise. The frustration on her face as she stormed out of the room was palpable. About half an hour later, I heard the front door slam. She left the house in a hurry, obviously upset. I took the opportunity of an empty house to pack up a few things. 
I took the bed apart and loaded it in the truck, along with most of my clothes. I would sleep on the sofa in my office tonight. Having everything I wanted to take first loaded in my truck, I fixed a gym beam on the rocks and relaxed. The sofa wasn't the most comfortable thing I've slept on, but it was okay. Early the next morning, I was at the leasing office and got the key to the apartment. It took me a bit, but I managed to get everything out of the truck and into the apartment. Thankfully, a couple of friendly neighbors assisted. No one was home yet when I returned, so I had a neighbor's teenage son help me load up my desk and office furniture. My computer, printer, and accessories went into the cab. I looked back into the living room and thought, screw it. I'm taking the recliner too. I guess either no one got home until that evening, or no one bothered to look into my office or the spare bedroom. I'm surprised they didn't notice the missing recliner, though. It was early evening before my phone rang. Seeing that it was my daughter, I answered it. Daddy, where are you? I'm at home, sweetheart. No, you aren't. Your office is cleaned out, the bed and dresser in the spare bedroom are gone, and your recliner isn't in the living room. Besides, I looked everywhere and you aren't here. Plus, your truck is gone. You're right. I'm not there. I am at home. I don't live there anymore. I moved into an apartment for now. Maybe after the divorce is final, I'll get another house, but this will do for now. God, Dad, I can't believe that you're being such an a-hole about this. I thought you loved us. I do love you, sweetie. I always have and always will. Just not enough to not abandon us. I'm not abandoning you. You will still be able to see me all you want. I'll still take care of you and your brother. You're abandoning us. You left us and are breaking up the family. Your mother is the one who broke up the family. I told her this is what would happen if she went out on that date. She did it anyway. But she thought you loved her enough to get past that, and I thought she loved me enough to not do it. Fine, whatever. Then she hung up. Yeah, the divorce was a nightmare. She fought it all the way. Counseling, she wanted me to pay for it, but I refused. I argued that if she wanted it, she should pay for it. That was one of the few arguments I won. What a waste of time. The counselor didn't like me very much. I think it had something to do with me telling him that I was ordered to attend but the judge said nothing about me actually participating. I suffered through all 12 sessions before the counselor finally gave up. She fought over literally everything, that worthless funny poster that was in the garage that she absolutely despised, suddenly she simply couldn't live without it, the bud light lamp that I accidentally left behind in the office. She hated it, but I had that on my desk since college, and now it became the piece she was going to redecorate the office around. Yeah, it was all just a game. She was only doing that to make the divorce as hard on me as possible, while also making it as difficult as she could for me to see the kids. Finally, the judge granted the divorce. I had to continue paying half the mortgage. She, of course, kept the house, and I had to pay $2,000 a month in child support. But I did get every Wednesday evening and every other weekend visitation. What really pissed me off was the $1,000 a month spousal maintenance for five years, which would be voided if she got remarried within that time. I wasn't going to hold my breath. I found out she had moved Clarence in with her before the divorce was even final. So, yeah, half my paycheck was going to her. I cashed in some of my investments and bought a small house that was in serious need of repairs. At least I got it cheap, and it was on a one-acre lot. Thankfully, I managed to sneak all my tools out of the garage the week after I moved out. I refused to even discuss them, most of them I had before we even met. When she pushed... I started talking about all her jewelry, expensive clothes, and shoes. The house had electricity, gas, and running water. The roof was on it, and the walls were standing, that was good enough for me. I moved in and began working on it in the evenings and weekends. Visitation? Yeah, I was supposed to have visitation. I actually did a few times too, but it was a disaster. Kayla did everything possible to interfere with it. The kids were busy, they went for a weekend thing with their friends. Funny how that was always on my weekends and not hers. Oh, Kayla has dance practice on Wednesday, or Josh has a huge test on Thursday and needs to study. 
the few times that I was actually able to have my Wednesday evening visitation, the kids were hostile to me. They still blamed me for everything, even though I explained my point of view. When the opposition has them as a captive audience literally all the time, and I only have an hour or two occasionally, it's a losing battle. After the third time, they flat out told me that they didn't want to see me anymore. Yeah, I could have forced it, but what would be the point? Forcing them to see me would have only caused more resentment. I sent them gifts, cards, and letters for their birthdays and Christmas. They were all returned unopened. I continued to send my monthly checks. I saw they were cashed but never heard a word. Graduation, I assumed they graduated, but I never heard anything about it. I sent a registered letter letting them know about the college funds I set up for them. I did hear back on that, no thanks. Kayla had effectively poisoned my kids against me, just like she said she would. I just concentrated on work in the house, and that's about it. I didn't go out or do anything. It's amazing how much money you can save by doing that. As if all that wasn't bad enough, hey, mom, I said when she answered the phone. Tom, how are you doing? She responded cheerfully. Doing as well as can be expected. Anyway, I haven't heard anything about Thanksgiving. Are you hosting it again this year? There was silence on the other end. Mom, you still there? I asked. Oh, well, this is a bit awkward. Yes, we are, but Kayla, her parents, and the kids are coming over for it. She's also bringing the new man in her life with her. We all just felt that having you here as well would be too awkward for everyone. After all, the kids are still angry at you for abandoning them, and you being here with Kayla and her new man would just make everyone too tense. Seriously, Mom? You're abandoning your own son on Thanksgiving and inviting my ex-wife and her boyfriend instead? Well, we want to keep our close relationship with our grandchildren. Besides, this is your fault. You should have worked to keep your family together instead of tearing it apart. How about coming over for Christmas Eve? Your father and I will be spending Christmas Day at Kayla's house, but we can celebrate it with you the day before. Forget it. You don't have a son anymore, so save it for the cheating, I mumbled as I ended the call. I spent Christmas Eve at home watching Die Hard and ignoring the multiple calls and text messages from my mom wondering where I was. I was not in the holiday spirit. I just stared at the packages I had sent to my kids. A week ago, they had been returned to my doorstep. Yesterday, I received a wedding announcement. After five years, Kayla ended up marrying Clarence the weekend after my last maintenance payment was made. Josh's 18th birthday was a year earlier, so I was already done with my child support. Now I was completely free and clear of my former family and my commitments to them. I celebrated by getting drunk. Yeah, I'm not proud of that, but screw it. I had worked my butt off and given them all the love I could, only to be rejected and treated like crap. Now that all my obligations to the witch and her two ungrateful devil spawns were completed, I decided to just put them out of my mind as much as possible. They obviously didn't want any sort of relationship with me, so I would just forget about them and move on. Well, except for one thing that had always bugged me, I had to keep paying half the mortgage on the house. Sure, that ended when Josh graduated from high school, but my name was still on the deed. I think Kayla was under the mistaken impression that the house was hers free and clear. The divorce only said that she got to live there until the children graduated from high school. Now all bets were off. I had a right to half of the assets, and that was a pretty big asset. I contacted my lawyer to start with. The story continues in the next video. Link to part 2 in the description of this video. Thank you for watching and for your likes.